But there are other ways to measure discontent beyond polls and election results. We saw the first wave of discontent with Obama's rule with the emergence of the Occupy movement in 2011 and then the eruption of Black Lives Matter in the summer of 2014. Both were products of the widening gap of inequality in the United States. That inequality was at the heart of the Occupy movement and its popularization of class inequality in the U.S. through the slogan of the 99% versus the 1%. But this inequality was also important in how we understand the emergence of Black Lives Matter. Black Americans, of course, took the brunt of the economic crisis in 2007 and 2008. It was in part how we understand the deep wells of support that existed for Obama and his campaign's ability to tap into the anger with the federal government's abject disregard for what was happening in black communities. We cannot understand, for example, the social catastrophe happening across black Chicago, where there will be 700 homicides in that city, the vast majority of which affect young black people. You cannot understand that social catastrophe without understanding the persisting effects of the economic crisis that never really ended in many black communities. Chicago has the third highest black unemployment rate of any major city in this country. It has the third highest poverty rate of a large city in the United States. Its black middle class is being gutted because of municipal, state, federal budget cuts that have wiped out public sector jobs in postal work, teaching, and other positions that have historically been the bedrock of black economic stability. The breakdown of this civic infrastructure in combination with the existing crisis of mass incarceration and what Michelle Alexander has called the new Jim Crow, the persistence of unemployment and underemployment and of under-resourced public services and institutions has created the pretext for deepening police presence in black communities and as a result exacerbating all of the conditions that justify the presence of the police in the first place. As living conditions in black communities have become harder, the police have been given license to respond with arrests and brutality. And while the emergence of Black Lives Matter has exposed the extent to which violent policing is institutionalized in this country, it nevertheless continues. The police are on pace to kill 1,200 people this year, more than last year when newspapers first begin to count. And substantively, more than the 928 a year the FBI had been suggesting as an average two years earlier. If you want to understand why the black vote was depressed compared to 2008 and 2012, it can be found in the inability of the American government to aggressively intervene and prevent the murder of black citizens by the state. Whether it's with the policing of black communities or the water crisis in Flint, the expectation that black Americans would be a firewall for Clinton was as offensive as it was reflective of a kind of liberal contempt for the daily struggles of working class and poor people. There is just the expectation that no matter what is happening in your life and how terrible things might be, and no matter how unresponsive the Democratic Party may be, you still have to vote for them. And then the bitterness directed at people when they don't respond in such a way is even more contemptuous. This is true when liberals blame depressed black voter turnout for the election results, but it is also the case when they blame working class whites from, quote, voting against their interests, as if somehow voting for the neoliberal yet civil politics of the Democratic Party are in the interest of the working class. And as an aside... Working class interests are never on the ballot in bourgeois elections. But when it comes to the fate of ordinary white people, who despite the media and academic fascination with for the moment, these are people who are also regularly ignored. We have heard all sorts of dime store psychology about the so-called white working class, 
most of it thinly veiled elitism. White workers feel entitled. They are only interested in themselves. They are privileged. They are racist scum. They are just bad. In total, it reflects the political establishment's contempt for the struggles of regular people. If you only read these reports or assessments, you would think there was no inequality experienced by white working class people or that ordinary white people were just living the high life. But when we consider the experiences of white working class people within the context of the attacks on working class standards in general, we get a different picture. And what would happen if we told the story of black Chicago and other black communities across this country as part of the same story of what is happening to ordinary white people? For example, there is the continuing crisis of opioid or narcotic addiction in this country. While people are quick to point out how differently it is received compared to the war on drugs directed at black communities in the 1980s and 90s, which is undoubtedly true, what does this crisis at this particular moment in time tell us about the conditions of working class life and working class people? There are two million people addicted to opioids in the U.S. Half of those people are addicted to heroin. Earlier this year, it was reported that there had been a decline in the life expectancy for white women and a plateauing of life expectancy for white men. In the U.S. peer countries, life expectancy is growing. Why is life expectancy for white women in decline in this country? drug overdose, suicide, and alcohol abuse. So if we told the stories of the destruction of working class black life alongside the stories of the destruction of working class white life, it could allow us to see that the anxieties, stresses, confusions, and frustrations about life in the world today are not owned by one group, but are shared by many. It would not tell us that everyone suffers the same oppression or exploitation, but it would allow us to see that even if we don't experience a particular kind of oppression, every working person in this country is going through something. Everyone is trying to figure out how to survive, and many are failing. If we put these stories together, we would gain more insight into how the white working class and poor have as much stake in the fight for a different kind of society as anyone else. We wouldn't so casually dismiss their suffering as privilege because they do not suffer as much as black and brown people in this country. The privileges of white skin run very thin in a country where 19 million white people languish in poverty. Apparently, the wages of whiteness are not so great to stop millions of ordinary white people from literally drinking and drugging themselves to death to escape the despair of living in this so-called greatest country on earth. If we put these separate stories together into a single story, we could make better sense of why socialism is rising in popularity, why people have taken to the streets over the last five years to protest the growing racial and economic inequality in this country. 51% of 18 to 29-year-olds say they are against capitalism, even if they are not fully convinced of what should replace it. 47% agreed that basic necessities, such as food and shelter, are, quote, a right that the government should provide to those unable to afford them. In the 1970s, 61% of Americans fell into that vague but stable category of middle class. Today, that number has fallen to 50%. It is driven by the growing wealth inequality that exists here. In general, the richest 20% of households in the U.S. own 84% of the wealth in this country while the bottom 40% own less than 1%. In other words, there are 400 billionaires in this country. They are the reason why there are 47 million poor people. You cannot have untold obscene wealth unless you have untold obscene poverty. That is the law of the market. 
And how does such a tiny percent of the population unjustly hold on to their wealth, even when millions agree that it should be redistributed? Racism, immigrant bashing, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, nationalism. They get us to fight each other while they hoard their wealth. Our stories are not all the same. We do not all have the same experiences, but our hardships often emanate from the same source, a market-based economy that privileges the wealthy over the welfare and lives of the people who create that wealth. And they keep our stories separate from each other so that we never understand the entire story, only our particular part of it. But even with great effort to keep our side divided and confused, millions of people are coming to grips with the harsh reality of an economic system that guarantees them nothing but a future of hardship and an inability to ever get ahead. But the knowledge alone of the existence of racism, inequality, poverty, and injustice does not necessarily equip our side with the political tools needed to fight the battles of today or to fight for a socialist future. We need struggle. We also need politics because we must contend with a political establishment that wants to lower our expectations to believe that the existing society is the best that we can expect from humanity.